and Kobe Pierce come, come acknowledging and professing their dependence on the Lord to raise this precious child, Sawyer Brian Pierce. Do you come professing Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your lives? Yes, they do. And do you come to dedicate yourselves to biblical instruction, discipline, and love of this precious one? Yes, they do. And do you come to dedicate Sawyer Brian into the ultimate control and will of God through the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. All right. Now I'm turning to the church. Church, do you agree to support these parents by your example? And through acts of service, and do you agree to reinforce the biblical instruction, discipline, and love of this child under the supreme rule of the Lord Jesus Christ? If so, you may signify by standing, please. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. I I know that was quick. (laughs) But I wanted to search among you. (laughs) Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's pray. I'm just going to put my hand on it. Let's pray. I got to kiss him. (laughs) Father, he almost opened his eyes for a minute, didn't he? Father, we bring Sawyer Brian to you with all our heart, soul, and might. We want to raise this child to love you and serve you. Please help us to be the congregation and parents that will set the right example for this precious one and that this child might love and serve you throughout his life. We pray this in Jesus' name with glory and honor and thanks to you. Amen. I introduce to you part of our family, Sawyer Brian Pierce. Thank you, guys. Thank you, you bet. God bless you. Ring the bell. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this star. I'm a part of Thank you, Lord. Once again, officially from up here, I guess, uh, good morning. Welcome to all of our online community who are joining us today. Uh, a couple of things coming up. I always want to have been, been mentioning the Hot Rod Roundup. Uh, a lot of you were down last night at the Working Ranch uh, Rodeo, and uh, we had a great time. There was a young man who had a very bad wreck that we're, we're not sure exactly what's going on yet, but we're, uh, we're praying for Josh, if you just keep Josh in your prayers. But, but we had a great time. We're going to have another time of fellowship at the Hot Rod Roundup, September the 25th from 9 to 3 o'clock. Cool old cars and cool old people. So many we've had sign up already. Uh, unfortunately, we got rid of the only classic car I had. It was, it was kind of a family heirloom. 
you know, being a pastor, I'm the first one in my family, that's for sure. <laughs> but even, even being a musician, there really weren't. I come from a long line of plumbers, and uh, I had the actual old company car, the original company car. It was, it was a yellow Rambler station wagon. Yeah, had a plunger on the hood. <laughs> company motto on the door. In our business, a flush beats a full house. <laughs> I, I didn't want to bring that down to the church. I thought that, was, that probably would have been out of line just a little bit. As we go to the Lord this morning, we're, we're expanding our family. We join together as a family. Let's join together in prayer in agreement with one another for Josh, the young man who, uh, who struggled. We have so many uh, in our church family who are, who are ill and who have gone to be with Jesus. So uh, please know as we walk through these times, there's so many that need, that need comfort. Let's pray. Father God, uh, I'm, I'm seeing faces and names in my mind, and you know them better than I do, Father. As we gather together as a body, we lift them up. Uh, I lift up Josh, the young man, that's, uh, and I just pray your healing on him and so many. I pray those who are with you, newly with you, Father God, that, that they are looking right at your smiling face. And I pray that we would, in the midst of our sorrow, that we would have the comfort uh, of knowing that you have them in your hands and in your arms. As we lift our voices this morning, I pray that it would be a pleasing fragrance to you and that we could take for ourselves the joy of serving you. We pray all that in Jesus' name with glory and honor and thanks to you. Amen. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided Decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will. I'll carry till I see Jesus. I cross, I'll carry till I see Jesus. I cross, I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind. Thank you, Lord. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Turn the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell the news to every land. Climb the steeds across the way. Onward till the Lord command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. On the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell the sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing you island of the sea, echo back your ocean waves, earth shall keep what you believe, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout it brightly through the gloom. When the heart of mercy prays, sing and triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Hear the wind, the 
mighty voice, Jesus save, Jesus save, let the nation now rejoice, Jesus save, Jesus save, shall salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest cave, this our song of victory, Jesus save, Jesus save. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Yeah. I got to get some air in here just a minute. This is, I think I'm all over the whole COVID thing, but uh, between arena dust and smoke from those fires, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting a good breath. Anybody else having a little struggle breathing through all of this? Man, it's getting crazy, isn't it? I did that wrong, didn't I? this time. the cattle absolutely how's everybody doing this morning outstanding you know we're doing a uh, good too you know that the smoke is just unbelievable i yeah, just it cannot is. quite get over how smoky it is i think it's smokier now than what it was back in 2012 when we had Walgo all the Canyon problems fire. around here yeah, but, we uh, you know we got to keep our prayers up for those uh, firemen that's trying to fight these blazes in california Amen. yep you know, this is our opportunity when we like to talk about our offering here at Church on the Ranch. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go through that real quick. We have these little black boxes, and they're spread throughout our church. We've got one in our stables area and our overflow, our corridor. Corridor. And we got one back here between these two double doors. Today we've got Tim back there. <laughs> Tim Harrington is man in the lights today. That's right. He's the light manner. Light manner back there. He's... <laughs> Doing a good we job. We got to come up with a better name for that. I know. Yeah. There's got to be something else out yeah, there. Yeah. I'm sure. Specialist or organizer or yeah. something. But, uh, you know, that box, that, that box back there that he's highlighted, that's our offering box. And that's where you'll put your offering as you're coming or going from the sanctuary. And uh, thank you for your participation back there. Tim did a great job. Back Thanks, there. Tim. Give Tim a hand. Absolutely. We appreciate yeah, you, brother. Absolutely. God bless you, man. Absolutely. So if you all don't mind at this time, I'd like to go ahead and say a little prayer over offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for many blessings. Lord, uh, the smoke is a little thick, uh, but we know that you got this under control. Lord, I do want to say a special prayer for the firefighters and everyone mm -hmm. who's fighting those fires out in California. Lord, just give them strength and give them the knowledge that they need to get those fires put out. Say a special prayer for Josh, Lord, uh, once again. Please look over him, put your healing hand upon him, and lift him right up to you. And dear Lord, uh, I would like to say a prayer to bless the gift and the giver, and then our praises that we sing to you today are glorifying. All this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to Cause he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds a future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. 
sweet to hold. to sing that high on it. I think I pulled something on there. (laughs) You know, there was a guy named uh, Robert Robinson back in the 1700s. He had a rough beginning. His father died when he was young and his mother was unable to control him. So she sent him to London to go to barbering school to study barbering. But all he learned was about drinking and gang life. Anybody else do that when you went to college? When he was 17, he and his friends reportedly visited a fortune teller, and they'd been drinking quite a bit, so they were just kind of making light of it and uh, trying to have fun, but there was something about that encounter that bothered Robert quite a little bit, so uh, there was an evangelistic meeting in town being held by George Whitfield. Some of y'all have heard that name, and so he talked his friends into going to it with him. Whitfield was one of history's greatest preachers. He had a voice that was part foghorn and part violin, is what they said, and he was responsible for, uh, for, for, for all kinds of folks coming to the Lord. That night he preached on Matthew 3, 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And, and Whit- Whitfield, who had such a heart for, for lost folks, said, oh, the wrath to come. He, he started crying. He burst into tears, the wrath to come. And Robert immediately sobered up. He knew that there was something spiritual going on, and he felt like Whitfield was preaching directly to him. I think there were thousands of folks that probably felt that way. The words honored him for the next couple of three years, and on December 10th, 1755, he gave his, he gave his heart to Christ. 
And he soon went into ministry. And three years later, uh, when he was 23, he was writing a sermon for, for Pentecost Sunday. And it was a prayer he had that the Holy Spirit would flood into our hearts with streams of mercy, enabling us to sing God's praises and remain faithful to him. You might recognize that term, streams of mercy. And the words to this hymn floated out of him. Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the name I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my heaven desert. Hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the folds of God, he to rescue me from danger, in oppose his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Come thou fount of every blessing. The message today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. If, if you have your Bibles with you, Jesus first says one of the seven I am statements. He said, I am the, I am the bread of life might still be speaking directly to us as well as his disciples and certainly to the crowd of, of Pharisees and Jews that was before him then. We, we tend to look at bread just, just a little bit differently now. I, I struggle with my weight. Do some of y'all struggle with your weight? You know, all over the world, there are folks that don't struggle with their weight. They really don't have any problem at all. As a matter of fact, they're starving to death. They're starving to death. The, the struggle is getting enough food to get by and they're, they're stunned when they find out that in this country we have food that we that we just throw away i'm i'm trying to lose weight my goal for for this year was to lose 10 pounds i've only got about 15 to go i think <laughs> be all right. i saw a little list on there that just resonated with me uh, see, the other day I was, I was in the, we have our, our scale in the bathroom right in front of the mirror. So I got up on the scale to, to see how much progress I was not making. And uh, you know, when it's right in front of the mirror, you kind of want to look better. So you know how you do sometimes that kind of sucked my belly in. And Cindy said, I don't think that's going to help your weight. <laughs> I said, well, it really does help though, because it's the only way I can see those little numbers down here <laughs> on this thing. A recent study found that women who carry a little extra weight live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone right then. See, our, our country is different. We're, we're not used to any hardship, anything that kind of takes us out of our way anymore at all. Like, you remember back when we were kids and every time it was below zero outside, they closed school? You guys remember that? Neither do I. <laughs> we walked to school. You know, I, I think that, that the Lord, as he speaks with these folks, is, is talking to us. In John 6, 24 through 35, it starts off, he's already fed the 5,000 in the first part of the gospel of John, and then he's, he's walked on the water, which, which is not in, 
it's not in all the Gospels. In the Gospel of Luke, the walking on the water part's not even really included. And that's, that's easily ex- explainable because they all had a different perspective. They all had a different point of view. Matthew and, and John, they were firsthand witnesses to these miracles. Uh, the Gospel of Mark... Uh, that was written uh, probably from Peter's perspective, and he didn't really care to share his walking on the water part of that. He just shared the storm. And then Luke, if we look at Luke, he's kind of a, he's a historical reporter. He's interviewing people, trying to find out what they thought about it. Not, not all of Jesus' teachings in the Bible could be called sermons, but this one certainly falls into that category. It could be titled very simply, I am the bread of life. It's really a, a theme that, that rings with candor. He's saying to me, maybe to you, you are inherently, Scotty, selfish and materialistic. Try to seek spiritual and eternal values is what you need to do where you can find that stuff only in me. The proposition is clear. My father sent me down from heaven to be your your spiritual bread. So when we hear bread, uh, we're maybe thinking uh, of something completely different than what Jesus is talking about. And certainly these crowds were. In a nutshell, there are four different retellings from four different perspectives, but the point remains the same. We have all these testimonies to supply information about the life and ministry and death of Jesus of Nazareth. They all provide varied details, but they have a lot in common. So by God's wisdom, he inspired all of these gospels, each of us to tell something different. The Savior, we're told here, and John does the Father's will, and one aspect of that will is to, is to hold on to all believers. When the crowd realized that Jesus, neither he nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and they went to Capernaum in, in, in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? See, they'd been over there looking for him because uh, they wanted some more bread. He just fed that 5,000. And when they ask him, when did you get here? Jesus doesn't even answer the question. In verse 26, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and, and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his, his seal of approval. And then they ask him, what must we, we do to do the, the work that God requires? They really didn't hear Jesus, did they? He had just said, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. See, what we do is believe and receive. And Jesus answered, he tells them again, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And they still don't get it, so they ask for a sign. What sign will you give that we may, that we may see it and, and, and believe it? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're kind of challenging Jesus. I mean, that's great. You fed 5,000 folks. I mean, that's cool. We trust that. But Moses with the manna from heaven, he fed the whole nation for 40 years. So they're, they're kind of giving him the business. And Jesus tells him, very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Moses didn't give him anything. See, they didn't understand the miracle of the 5,000 didn't come from the hands of the disciples. That came through the hands of the Savior For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they they always give us this bread. Jesus then declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirsty. He tells us as he continues on that the Father brings them, and he's not going to lose any of them. He says, I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. It's been a struggle for theologians all through the years. Some of them, it doesn't trouble me at all. The Father does, the Savior does the Father's will, and one aspect of that will is to hold on to all believers, losing none of them. 
See, I believe that Jesus plumbed the depths of this doctrinal debate, which is waged for ages. Those who've been given to the Savior have guaranteed resurrection. They will be raised up at the last day. Jesus tells it very clearly here. Why? Because it's the Father's will. Everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. This is the great theme of both John and the Apostle Paul. Eternal life was purchased at the cross, and it was guaranteed at the empty tomb. Now, John's gospel is selective, and so he's just telling us the stories that that support what he's trying to tell us, what he wants us to know. He's already said in John 20, just a little further on, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not even recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What are the works of God? To believe in the one whom he sent. This, the, all these books were written, more stories. He tells us at another place than there is paper and pen to write that would testify. But the point is, it's written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in, this, in his name. So, so Jesus has, has fed them, fed the 5,000 who've been traveling along, and he's been feeding. And then he left them. And matter of fact, he sent the disciples ahead. He compelled the disciples to get into the boat because he knew that they were in danger. And, and the crowd was now aroused, and, and there was a movement to make him king. The Lord was never impressed by the crowds. So he sent the disciples off, and then he left them. And then when they followed him, he taught them. The purpose of of the sign, the purpose of the miracle, John calls miracles signs in his gospel, was that he might preach this sermon, this sermon of the day, I am the bread of life. It was a ministry of grace and truth. In grace, our Lord fed hungry people, but in truth, he gave them the word of God. They wanted the food, but they wanted nothing to do with the truth. And in the end, most of them abandoned Jesus. They refused to walk with him. He lost his whole crowd. In one sermon, happens sometimes still today, doesn't it? We come to church and we get challenged just a little bit. And so sometimes we don't remember that Jesus, he didn't didn't trust the crowds. Bread and circuses were Rome's formula for keeping people happy. and, 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 And today people are kept happy in the same way. He was rescuing the disciples from a greater danger than the storm, the danger of being swept along by this fanatical crowd. And so he's sharing with them as they have followed him because they want some more bread. Just because you fed it that day, we want to be fed the rest of our lives every day like our ancestors were. There's an old Jewish story, a bit of humor that talks about an old man who goes to a diner every day for lunch. And he, he orders a, a bowl of soup, the soup du jour, whatever they have on, on, on the menu that day. And one day, the manager of the restaurant asked him, how was your soup? He said, it was great. But you know, you need to give more than, than two slices of bread. That's, that's not enough. So the guy went in every day. The next day, he comes back in. So the manager says, make sure to give him four slices of bread, which they do. And when he asked him how the soup was, once again, he said, you know, you're, the only thing is you're not giving me enough bread. I need more bread. So this continues. It, start, it gets, becomes a game. That pretty soon, they give him eight slices of bread. Finally, they give him a whole loaf of bread. And he stood there smugly knowing the guy had to be satisfied. And he said, you know, I, I still feel like you could give more bread, more slices of bread. So the guy is, he's almost irritated. He goes down to the bakery and he buys a big six foot long loaf of bread. And when the guy comes in, he and the waitress there cut it in half. So they have two six foot long halves of bread and they butter it up really good. And it takes up almost the whole lunch counter where he's sitting there. The guy finishes his soup and he eats all of that bread. The manager meets him on the way out and he asks him, well, how was your lunch today? He said, well, the soup was great as normal. But he said, I notice you've gone back to just two slices of bread. <laughs> We can be that way sometimes, can't we? Sometime this week, you're probably going to make a trip down to the grocery store to get a loaf of bread, and it'll be readily available on the shelf, hopefully, even when we're running out of stuff. Seems like they had bread on there. 
And there's quite a variety to choose from. You probably pay very little attention to the price of that bread, not realizing that the package that the bread is wrapped in actually costs more than, more than the wheat that is in the bread. All in all, you would think it was an uneventful trip, but you would be wrong. See, it's just in, in our generation, in these modern times, 20,000 years before Jesus, the Galileans gathered up wild grain, according to the Smithsonian Institute, now, their research team found grain among the ruins of an ancient community near the Sea of Galilee. It would take another 10,000 years for people to start planting wheat uh, and beating the grain into flour for bread. They had no bread, then they just ate the seeds. In, in the fertile northland of Galilee, where most of Israel's rain falls about 30 inches a year, wheat became the main crop. They finally figured out that it grows better in certain areas. But if you wanted some bread from that at that time, first of all, you cut the stalks of wheat when it was ripe. Then you thresh the stalks to loosen the grain from the heads. You winnow the, the wheat by tossing it into the wind to let the wind blow uh, with the stalks and the chaff. And then sift the remaining chaff and load up the wheat grain. Then you grind the flour into bread. A little different, isn't it? from just running down to the store and picking up a few loaves of bread. And in the feeding of the 5,000, actually probably was, was barley bread because uh, the wheat harvest wouldn't have been for a couple of more months, which actually was much, much cheaper, much less tasty. And it, it would have been something that a young, poor boy would have that Jesus multiplied. The point is, it's difficult for us as Americans to understand the importance of bread unless we turn on our TV and watch what's going on in so many parts of the world today. You know those commercials that we just switch past real quick, where they have little kids that are starving to death? See, we hate to really think about that, but that's going on. That really is. When there's no wheat, when there's no bread, no staff of life, there's suffering and famine. It's only as we comprehend that situation that we really begin to understand the importance of bread, not only now, but also in the time of Jesus. Just think for a moment how, how many significant theological events in the Bible revolve around the subject of bread. The most important event in the Old Testament, the Exodus, the, the trip from Egypt to the promised land. What, what caused the Hebrews to be in Egypt in the first place? You might remember it was famine. It was famine. It was lack of bread. The wheat crop had failed due to drought, and the Hebrews had, had migrated to the land of Pharaoh because there was a, a surplus in storage there. It was either bread or the lack of it that initiated this whole chain of events. Later, when the Jews were on their way to the promised land and they were facing starvation in, in the bleak wilderness, God rained down bread from heaven, the manna that they were challenging Jesus with. When Jesus began his ministry, he went into the desert where he was tempted. And as the hot sun baked down on him, he looked out with sweaty eyes at these round white rocks. And, and we're told that they had the appearance of, of loaves of bread. And so Satan began tempting Jesus to give bread to the people and end the suffering of world hunger. Yes, Jesus, Jesus spurned the temptation because he said that man cannot live by bread alone. It was kind of a foreshadowing of the message that he's sharing with the Hebrews today. One day Jesus was praying by the roadside when the disciples walked up and saw him and they were so impressed with the genuineness of his prayer that they said, Master, teach us how to pray. And in the midst of his prayer, he reminds us of the importance of the staff of life. Give us this day our daily bread. It wasn't something that they took for granted Maybe supremely we remember bread because it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he met with his disciples in that event that we now call the Last Supper. As he did so, he took a loaf of bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. You just can't escape the significance of bread uh, in our Judeo-Christian heritage, which brings us to the story this morning. It begins with the feeding of the 5,000 when the, the small boy had five little barley loaves and, and two fish, and, and Jesus was able to feed the entire multitude that was assembled. The actual group that, that Jesus is speaking to in our message this morning is that the part of that group that followed him to continue to get the bread. Some of them may have gone home. 
After this event, Jesus goes into his teaching, but there's an issue because now the scribes and the Pharisees want to call him on why he's not going to provide bread every day like Moses did. See, from, from the, the time of, of the Old Testament, there had been a strong rabbinic belief that when the Messiah came, he too would bring manna from heaven. That had been the Superman act of Moses. So in other words, as I mentioned earlier, they're challenging Jesus now. That little piddly miracle... That's nothing compared to what Moses did. And so Jesus reminds them that that miracle didn't come from Moses. It came from God. But they were not impressed. Jesus meets these expectations by saying that they had misinterpreted Moses' event. First of all, he reminded them that the bread didn't come from Moses, but from God. But they were putting the emphasis in the wrong place. Moses was the facilitator, not the originator They failed to see that the real bread from heaven was not manna, was not any kind of physical bread. That was only meant to be a foreshadowing, a symbol of the true bread. The real bread from heaven comes down and feeds not only one man's physical needs, but also his spiritual hunger as well. It was at this point, and don't miss the significance of this, that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Bread is central to the major stories of the Bible, and it plays a significant role, but we need to understand first that to satisfy our hunger for heaven, we cannot eat the bread of earth. To satisfy our hunger for heaven, we cannot eat the bread of earth. We struggle with many of these concepts from our human perspective. We can't see how divine sovereignty and human responsibility can work together. But from God's perspective, there's no conflict. When a church member asked Charles Spurgeon how he reconciled these two, he said, I never try to reconcile friends. Thank you, Lord. He said, I never try to reconcile friends. It's the Father's will that sinners be saved and that those who trust in Christ be secure in their salvation. Believers receive eternal life and Jesus can never lose them. What, what Jesus is saying here is, is, is there's a deeper aspect to the whole issue. If you take a look at it, 200 years before Jesus arrived on the scene, there was a Roman emperor whose name was Aurelian, and he initiated something called the bread dole. I remember when I was young, my grandpa would talk about folks that were on assistance as, as being on the dole. Anybody remember when that term was more commonplace? They had the Roman bread dole 200 years before Jesus, which meant that grain could be supplied to the poor at half price. But this dole quickly became a political tool to be used by tribunes to buy voters. If Jesus was not careful, this whole thing of giving bread could quickly degenerate into a tool to win friends and influence people. He would become just another demagogue, just another politician. See, the point here is that bread can be used as a weapon, physical bread, loaves of bread. On the surface, feeding the world's hungry sounds like such an ideal thing, but when you look a little deeper, it's pretty complicated. In a novel, The, uh, the Brothers Karamazov, I hope I'm saying that right, we, we read a fictionalized scene that takes place between an old church cardinal, a grizzled old church cardinal who's engaged in the Spanish Inquisition, and Jesus, who in this case has supposedly come back to earth. This crooked old cardinal chastises Jesus for missing his golden opportunity in the desert when he did not give bread to the people. Mankind, he told Jesus, would have run after you, grateful and obedient, though forever trembling with fear that you might withdraw your hand and would no longer have loaves. You did not want to make men slaves, but here too your judgment was too high for all men are slaves. That's what this crooked old cardinal said to Jesus. That's what the prince of darkness said to Jesus. See, I've always thought the temptation for Jesus just to give bread and to feed everyone almost immediately had to have been great because his huge compassionate heart had to struggle with folks that didn't have anything to eat and knowing that he could have done something about it See, 
Bread plays a significant role in every country and in every life, but we need to understand, second, that to satisfy our hunger for heaven, we have to eat the bread of heaven. Jesus was saying life in its most elementary form depends on bread, but bread only sustains life. It does not make life what God intended for it to be. Someone has written kind of a powerful treatise on this. It said, bread has, the, has power, but in the end, its power will fail. Bread can buy you land, but not love. It can buy you bonds, but not brotherhood. Gold, but not gladness. Silver, but not sincerity. Hospitals, but not wealth. Three carrots, but not character. Houses, but not homes. You can trade bread for commodities, but not comfort. Real estate, but not righteousness. Hotels, but not heaven. See, to satisfy your hunger for heaven, you cannot eat the bread of earth. You must eat the bread of God. The bread is he who come down, who has come down from heaven to give life to the world. And who is that? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. To the crowd, the crowd says to Jesus, give us bread from heaven. Do what Moses did and we'll be satisfied. But Jesus is saying, I'm the bread from heaven. So you're not figuring this out. He who comes after me will never hunger as bread nourishes us physically. So Jesus nourishes us spiritually. See, look at our own children as proud parents. As as I look down at, at precious Sawyer this morning. I mean, we provide. You guys are providing all the physical needs. You, you feed, you clothe them. I, I did, tried to do that for my kids the best I could. We give them warm beds. And, and even I became fairly proficient at changing diapers. How you doing with that, Kobe? Pretty good diaper changer now. That's awesome. Even my kids and my grandkids. But as they grew older, their needs got so much deeper. They got deeper than, now, than those physical needs. They, they needed to be, to be loved and held and, and encouraged and supported. They wanted to play. They had a desire for knowledge. See, our children hunger after new experiences, and so do we. In short, we desire our quality of life, not just mere existence. And that's what Jesus ultimately provides for us, a way to get beyond ourselves get beyond mere existence and experience life and an intensity of life that we've never experienced before. We hunger for bread that doesn't perish, whether we know it or not. We yearn for bread that's not here today and gone tomorrow. You can't live on bread alone. Jesus told us we crave the staff of life which nourishes us for all eternity. To satisfy your hunger, you cannot eat the bread of earth. To satisfy your hunger for heaven, you must eat the bread of heaven. And what is that bread? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the bread of life now and forevermore. One of my favorite authors, as many of you know, is C.S. Lewis. And he's he's written a a series of children's stories called The Chronicles of, of Narnia. In the fifth volume, it, it's called The Voyage of the Dawn Trader. They actually made a movie out of that. Did, did a couple of y'all ever see that movie? I, I can't recommend C.S. Lewis highly enough. But in this volume, Mary, who's, who's one of the children that go to Narnia, Edmund, her brother, and their cousin Eustace, and, and a lot of colorful creatures that, that are from Narnia, they come upon this crystal clear pool of water, with what appears to be a golden statue of a man at the bottom. Only they discover that it's a magical pool. And actually, it turns everything that enters the pool into gold. Anything that touches the water turns to gold. And it appears that the statue at the bottom of the pool is is really a man who either didn't know the pool's magic powers or he was so concerned consumed with, uh, with accumulating gold that he ignored the dangers. Even though the characters of the story are awed at the magic of the pool, they recognize that such a place is far more dangerous than it is beneficial. Jesus, just like Jesus rec- recognized that the disciples were in far more danger of that crowd appealing to their base nature, their lower nature. They were in much greater danger there than they were in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. So the characters in the voyage of the dawn trader swear to themselves to secrecy and they, they wipe their, their memories clean of that place. 
And see, there's a message here for us. When, when we waste our energy seeking to fulfill the hunger for things that perish, for things that don't last, things that go away, what we find all too often is that we'll still be dissatisfied. And our dissatisfaction will usually put us into deeper into the hole. And actually, we end up digging a hole deeper for ourselves altogether. Whatever piece of the pie that you're hungering for, whether it's a a bigger slice of acceptance or or, or riches or gratification of your urges, you're going to find yourself hungry for more and more and more. See, there's not enough stuff that we try to accumulate that's going to fill that empty hole inside of us, that hole that Pascal said was a God-shaped hole in your heart. O- only God can fill that. And-, and we go for more and more until we're so out of control that we can't backpedal fast enough. We've already fallen into that pool, and we're going to end up like the statue of that man of gold in, in the bottom. In our consumer-driven world, in which many people literally work themselves to death, accumulating a, a never fully satisfying abundance of things, Jesus' word challenges our society's misguided substitute for life. And he tells us clearly that he is the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. To satisfy your hunger for heaven, you can't eat the bread of earth. That bread is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted the bread of heaven to come into your heart to be the Lord of your life, this is the first I am statement. He is the only begotten Son of of God. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. There's nothing we can do to add to or take away from that. All we can do is believe. When they ask him, how can we do the works of God? He said, believe in him that God sent. If you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart, ask him this morning. Let this be the day you make the most important eternal decision that you have ever made. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Those of us who know he's the bread of life, let's meet him on our knees, humbly and gratefully at the foot of the cross and receive all that he has for us today. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are the bread of life. And I pray this morning, Father, that you could open up the eyes of our heart, that each one of us would sense your presence in an ever more powerful way, that just as we come to the communion table together, Father, that that we could feed spiritually on your nature and on who you are and what you have intended and provided for us. For my friends who don't know you, to pray this simple prayer. Uh, I I repent of my sins, Lord Jesus. I know that my sin had separated me from you. There was nothing I could do about it. All I could do was believe in you, believe that you are the bread of life, that you are the one who the Father sent, that no one can snatch me from your hand. So I ask you to take over my life. Be the the Lord, Father. I've, I've made a mess of things. I thank you for the prevenient grace that brought me here this morning, for the saving grace that accomplishes this in your strength and none of my own, and for the sanctifying grace that will take me from this moment and transform me into your image. We pray all this in the strong and mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ with glory and honor and thanks to you. Amen. Shall we gather at the river where bright angels be to draw?
Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Welcome to Sawyer, Brian, Pierce. If you get a chance on the way by, uh, come by and, and greet them and welcome him to the family of God. We're so glad that you're here. As you go from this place, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. God bless you. Have a great week. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river.